Hello, Tom Lavecki here with the latest edition of the New Theory Podcast. We have been very fortunate and we have many different people from many different walks of life on the podcast. We had Jeff Hoffman, who's a billionaire, uh, founding team of Priceline, Gary Vaynerchuk of VaynerMedia. We had successful doctors. We had a cosmologist on recently, Dr. Barton Keating. We have different people from different walks of life. And for those people, if you discover the podcast, the whole goal is to take these different people from different walks of life and kind of unpack what they did, how they do it, and to make it applicable in your own life, even though the subject matter may not be relevant. And in this case, it probably is not. However, it's super fascinating. Um, our most popular genre or guests, whether we like it or not, uh, tends to be our members of La Cosa Nostra or the Italian Mafia. Um, we had some associates on, uh, John A. Light, and I kind of let's go sequentially. Uh, Mike Frances had on a while ago, from her audio only, to making $8 million a week uh, on a gas cam. He kind of brought us to the 70s and 80s. We had John A. Light on, uh, former enforcer for John Gotti Jr., and Gotti, Gotti family had him on many times, front of the show. He kind of brought us into the 90s, early 2000s. And then very recently, we had Jim Brillo and Hootie on, and they talked about the more 2000s, uh, up until probably 13-ish, which brings us to our next guest. And this is really critical. So for those people that are watching or listening, uh, and we have to hide his face, uh, our next guest is coming on really, really, really um, uh, on his own will. We, have, we, we chat a little bit, full disclosure. Um, he, I trust him. He trusts me. We're going to do a live tape discussion. Um, he's a MAID member. His name is John Panisi, a MAID member. Uh, the Lucasia crime family, and uh, John, uh, and also author of Sit Down News, which we'll talk about a blog that he started, which caused a huge rumbling, which was featured in the New York Post. So with this long-winded introduction, John Panisi, welcome to New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? Hey, how are you, Tom? Well, so um, it's, like I said, like you're really going to bring us up to 2020, which is really interesting, and, and kind of the the transition the mob has made and pivot over the years and there's rumblings of kind of regrouping rumblings of former shadow but you're going to kind of dispel a lot of those things so before we jump in john uh let's let's talk about your formative years you know where did you grow up and kind of what made you know what kind of made you you um well first let me say that <laughs> i wish i was one of those doctors <laughs> or somebody else that you had on the show um and i am no longer a member so I want to just make that straight for the record. Um, I grew up in both um, sections of Queens, um, Ozone, Ozone Park and, and, and Howard Beach. And um, I was, was come from a broken home and lived with my father in Ozone Park and my mother lived in Howard Beach. And um, I don't know, I'm sure you heard from other people that Back then, in those, in that, at that, at that time, um, you could find the social club on on any corner <laughs> of yeah. that neighborhood. Yeah. And you know, as a result of that, as a young guy, and and, and and you know, many young guys, and it's unfortunate that we kind of look for like father figures. Yeah. If your father yeah. really isn't stepping up to the plate as a father, you look you look for a father figure or you look for somebody, you know, yes. and, and, you know, seeing these guys uh, out there in the street, um, you kind of, um, you know, that's what impress, that's what impresses a young guy. And, and, you know, that's, that's how these things start. They, they start seeing flashy clothes and cars back then everybody was in a suit. You know, it was a different time, different, different era. And, you know, you, at least for, for me, I, I was, I admired people like that. And instead of admiring the local firemen or what have you, I was, I, I looked up to the wise guy and tried to mimic them, you know, and, and it's funny because a lot of guys won't call themselves um, wannabes and they don't like that term. But at one point, I guess we were all wanted to be something. So we were all at a yeah. young age, a wannabe. 
Yeah. And we, we all who got involved in that life at one point in our lives were one of these. And just a side note, a funny, a funny thing is that a, someone once was a woman once called me a wannabe. And it was at the time that I was 100% in that life. And I laughed to myself and I had told uh, another guy, Johnny Sideburns, and he said, what do you want to be? You are. <laughs> so yeah. you know at, but anyway going back to um going back to my younger days in ozone park um that area was um entrenched with with wise guys and, and guys in the life and particularly the gambino family i mean that was their that was their neighborhood both those neighborhoods yeah. although in howard beach you had Vic Musso lived there. You had uh, Johnny Gotti lived there. You had um, um, Joe Messina. So you had bosses of other families that even lived within blocks of each other, and they were around. You know, you had a, a you had a mix of of all the families there. But but the Gambinos were very very prominent in Ozone Park and 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 Howard Beach, and we um, became friendly with. John Jr., um, you know, I was a young guy and, and my cousin and I were, were, were going to the club. And, you know, they had a, they had a, uh, they had a club, um, they had actually two clubs. You had uh, John's father had a club on 101st Avenue and, uh, and then on the side block was actually his brother Richie's club who John Jr. and a bunch of guys stood in that club. And, 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 you know, this is what happens is that you start coming around and, you know, a lot of people ask like, well, how does someone get involved? It's, <laughs> you, you, you know, and I've always given this answer later on in life is that you do not pick that life, that life picks you 100%. And, and what I mean by that is a guy don't, a, a young guy can't wake up tomorrow and say, I'm joining the mob. <laughs> you know, this is not a, you can't put an application in and it doesn't happen like that. Uh, John, was you, that John, was your, um, sorry to interrupt you, but John, so, so, so I want to I have some questions, but keep going. But my one question that I want to slide in is, was your father or any family members connected? My father was not. Okay. Um, I've had an, an uncle who's actually my mother's uncle who was um, with uh, Danny and Charlie Wagon's Fatico. Okay. Uh, so they, they brought, these are the guys who brought Johnny Gotti in. Yeah, they and, was, uh, John Gotti was his driver for Carmine, I believe. Yeah, well, these, these were, um, you know, these were the original, the original owners or makers or whatever way you want to say it of the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, which later John brought to Ozone Park. That club came from Fulton and Rockaway in East New York, Brooklyn. Yeah. So, yeah. So hold on, John. So, so I want to, so it's interesting because you talk to people throughout the country and people tend to kind of glom New York and New Jersey together. And I'll be the first to say, and you know this, New Jersey and New York are just, a lot different, a lot different. So if you grew up in, let's say, Howard Beach, Ozone Park versus growing up in, I grew up near Elizabeth, New Jersey, big yes. difference, right? But so we're both tiny American guys. We, you know, I do come from a, a separated family, a broken home, if you will. Um, yeah. We're a single mother family. I, I guess you lived more with your father or you had access to both. I had access to my father until he died when I was 17. But, but so I see, I see a commonality where you're like, okay, hey, wait, hey, wait a second. There wasn't a, a father figure consistent in the home or, Two parents. I, I kind of understand that part, right? And then the other part is I get like, it's like your cat, right? You don't choose your cat, your cat chooses you. So I get kind of like how you can get like moored into the life because it kind of finds you or it's around you, right? But one thing though, is to be really honest with you, like we're close in age and my one friend got into hedge funds, another friend got into mortgage. I, you know, got into a marketing firm. Not that we were like good guys or had access to what you had access to, but like we kind of had similar upbringings to you, not too far away from New York. I know in New York, there's more temptation. So I want to hear a little bit more about why you got into it. Cause I get the father figure. I get that. 
I get the, you know, you were kind of around these guys, but like, were you like, you know, were you like John, John A. Light said he was like, went to college, he was like playing baseball, but he just couldn't get out of it. Like, were you always meant for this life or did you try to like have a straight life it didn't work out and you pivoted over to organized crime. I just want to get a sense for that okay. part of your decision. Okay. Well, firstly, I, I don't want to be, um, I, I want to just say that, um, first of all, is you, everyone makes decisions in life and you have to be responsible for the decisions that you make. So I'm not blaming or trying to blame being com uh, coming from a broken home as yeah. an excuse that because there, there are plenty, plenty of kids and young people, both uh, uh, um, uh, male and female that come from broken homes that make yeah. it in life. that don't go to the life of crime. And, and, yeah. and that's a choice that an individual makes. I, so I, hold, on, hold on. Just like there's kids, that grew up in a normal, perfect family and they want to be in serial murders. So exactly. Categorically it's, agree with John. It's, it's, it's a life choice, right? And we're all responsible for the choices that we make. And I am taking responsibility for mine. I'm not even trying to say that my neighborhood or my parents or anyone um, pushed me in that direction. That's yeah. not, you go in the direction that you want to go in. Yeah. So I just wanted to clear that up. With that being said, yes, I did see... Um, when I went away um, in 1990 um, for a, um, a manslaughter conviction. Um, and how, came, how old were you? I had just turned 20 years old. Wow. Okay. So I came home in 2007 um, and just made my 38th birthday. So, you know, you're talking about a long stretch of time. Wow. And, um, so during that time that I was away, there were two major things that took place. And one of them was John Jr., all right? And not to go into this whole thing, but I think that everyone uh, probably on your show who listens to your show or who listens to uh, John, Johnny A. Lott, um, knows the whole situation, what happened with John Jr., right? He's 100% out of that life now for whatever reasons took place. Um, and I wasn't too happy with what I was hearing because I was in at the time at what, what John Jr. chose to do. And there was someone else who uh, was like a father fi figure to me. And his name was Tony Muscatello. And he was with John's father. And I had heard rumblings of things that happened with him. He later on got himself in trouble with the, um, um, the Sun Cruz casino case in Florida, and he's now doing life in prison. So there was two people who I admired that I had heard. Uh, I had heard, you know, from messages that came in that they have switched teams and I was so, you know, coming from these neighborhoods, it's, it's instilled in you that you do not cooperate with law enforcement. End of story. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And so with that being said, when I came home, I said, forget about this. You know, it's over. Forget about, forget about that. Let's, you know, enjoy life and, and, and go to work and do what I have to do. And, and I did try to do that for about four or five years and um at that point i had had stayed away i had gotten messages from people that tried to reach out and say they want to see me uh, you know let's let's be real what you know as far as people trying to recruit who better to recruit than somebody that has done that length of time in prison Correct. and they you know they knew me from the neighborhood and whatnot and i kept my distance i kept my distance and i stood away which unfortunately i wish i would have just continued on that path and i didn't um the thing that drew me back in and it drew me into another family was um a friend of mine that i had known in prison and he came from our neighborhood anthony guzzle had had 
got in touch with me and um, had just come home himself. And we were, like I said, we were way together and started, you know, come to Brooklyn. I'm, I'm at this restaurant and I started going back out, which I was, wasn't doing and staying with Anthony. And now I'm back in Brooklyn and, oh, even though we were Queens guys, you know, big difference. <laughs> and that is what, there was an incident that took place um, probably Wait, a hold month. On, hold on, before we get there, because I want to hear yeah. that story, because I read about it online, if, if it's what you're going to chat about, yeah. so I hear about it. But what is the difference between a Queens guy and a Brooklyn guy? Well, we were, well, I mean, listen, we, we, were, we were all different in our own ways. Yeah. Um, we just, listen, every borough would knock the next borough, right? Yeah. They would, the guys in the Bronx didn't like the guys from Queens or Brooklyn, or really hated the guys from Brooklyn. Yeah. And, 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 and back and forth. And not that there was much of a difference and I don't have, you know, nothing bad to say about guys from Brooklyn. It's just that we, 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 we were just different from Queens. I don't know. If you ask anybody from Queens, they would say we're different from the Brooklyn guys. And probably it's going to be vice versa that they would say we're well, different. But I, 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 would, I would agree with you in the sense where I get a different feel when I was growing up. Because I used to hang out in New York a decent amount. Yeah. Um, I, I get a different feel being in Howard Beach versus Bensonhurst, to be honest with you. Um, well, so I, well, when are you talking about? Uh, I'm a little younger than you. So I want to say in the 90s, Okay, uh, so no, there's Diker, I love Diker Heights, but I don't consider that like kind of mob area per se. Just figure that's kind of where nice a lot of guys live. But like, if I were to compare neck and neck, say, hey, Bensonhurst in the '90s, you know, going like 18th Avenue Feast and that kind of stuff, which was still kind of strong back then and for that life, versus Howard Howard Beach, I kind of felt like this. And this is like I'm gonna probably get shit for this. I kind of felt like the the the, the soldiers lived in Bensonhurst, but the bosses lived in Howard Beach. That's just well, my take. Well, that's. But, but it's an accurate, you know, that's the truth too. And not that there wasn't any bosses that came from Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Carlo Gambino lived in Brooklyn. You know, there was, it's just, there's no knock to the Brooklyn section of New York at all. Yeah. It's just that they would be telling you the same thing. If you were interviewing a guy from Brooklyn, they would look at us in Queens different. We looked at them and we all as a group looked at Jersey. Totally <laughs> <different>. <laughs> Agreed. All right. So, so, okay. So you're hanging out in Brooklyn. You got a chip on your shoulder because you're a Queens dude. What happened? You're with your boy Guzzo. <laughs> Guzzo. What happened next? What happens is, is he call, uh, calls me one night and tells me to come down to the restaurant. And I, and I go down and um, he explains to me that there were guys from Brooklyn. Cause once again, Anthony's a Queens guy yeah. and that he had been dating at the time, the owner of the restaurant and that, these guys, one guy threw a party for himself. <laughs> so us, us Queens guys ain't even throwing parties for ourselves. He threw a party for himself. <laughs> Another Brooklyn and, dick, but yeah. yeah. He threw, threw a party for himself and had about 30-something of his 30-something guys came. And they took a room. And, um, you know, as you know, when you book, book, book something in a restaurant, they're going to yeah. give you different prices. And I guess – his open bar ended at let's say 11 yeah and it, and then after 11 uh if anybody wanted any any drink thereafter it's going to be a totally different tab, like cash right? bar or whatever yeah yes so that that ends with, with at 11 o'clock or whatever it was and now they 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 run up about a 1500 dollar tab Yikes. afterwards right yeah. so when the guy goes to pay the bill he just wants to pay the first bill and when they hand him hey by the way here's a second bill for the bar tab he you know starts a whole big scene and says no and you know he you know he's a little drunk and belligerent plus he got 30 guys at the party was he was he if you don't mind me asking was he a, was he a connected guy that guy who had the party as far um as supposedly these were con guys that were uh, around and you know meaning that they were associated to the Columbus. Yeah. so so there's an incident that takes place between anthony and one of the guys and i'm not there for any of that but yeah. on the night that he calls me to come down um he's explaining what happened and you know i went there for dinner uh and brought another guy with me and while we're while we're 
were there, um, lo and behold, who shows up outside is um, uh, one of these guys from the party, and he got this big gorilla guy with him, and um, they're talking to the owner's son, uh, right? And and Anthony comes to me and tells me that they're out there, and to just speed the story up, uh, Anthony and I go and approach these two guys and get the better of them. And um, yeah, and um, as a matter of fact, they, <laughs> we, you know, we, this was right before Christmas and their friends complain that, you know, these guys got really banged up. You got to see what they look like. And, and <laughs> Anthony, I was saying, Anthony and I used to kid around and say, we were giving out slips and uh, uh, kicks and slaps for, for Christmas. Uh. And, and um, so, but what ensued after that is, is that these guys obviously ran to whoever they were with. And now we started hearing that guys on the street were looking for this John and Anthony and they, they were looking for us. Who were they? And, Hold on. Can you share who were they with or no? Um, I had no idea at the time who, who, but was, who it, was, was, it legit, but was it legit? Cause you know, you know, it's a, a lot of guys, you know who I am. Um, just have, the guys who say that are nobody because absolutely they shouldn't be saying that. So, so um, but, but when it, when these guys sent out feelers, the Colombo guys, sake of argument, let's say they got back to their Colombo upline, whether it be a made guy or captain or yeah. strong associate. When they yeah. kind of put the feelers out there, could you tell? Okay, hey, you know what? It's the Colombos, and these are like real guys or no real guys or what was um, it? Behind it? But yeah. Well, here's the problem is that at the time, both Anthony and myself have kind of stepped and stood on the sidelines and didn't put ourselves around anybody at that point in time. So it would have been a little hard for them to try to reach out to somebody and figure out where we where we're at. Got it. And, and but we have heard things. And so now, like I said, I just go back a little bit and remind you and I had been staying away, <laughs> away from whoever it was that I was around in the street back then because I didn't want nothing to do with it, nothing gotcha. to do with it no more. So now to go back with my tail <laughs> between my legs and say, Hey, I got a problem. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. So I was in a, I was in a, a you know, I was in a catch 22. So what I did was I went and seen another childhood friend of mine who was a friend with the Lucchese's. Hold on, and, a friend, because remember, not, we're not a, a mob-centric channel. So, so, a, friend, okay, so a, friend, a friend implies a maid, a maid member, correct? Correct, and that's the way we ref, we refer to one another. Amikonos. Um, yes, exactly. Oh, you know that. <laughs> so, so what, 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 what? I go to this friend who happens to be um, Vicar Musso's son-in-law. Oh, and, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Who was the boss? I, okay. <laughs> yes. And I, I explain what happened. So, you know, and, and he didn't seem too worried about it. But in the event that, you know, they did try to track us down, I already, I had him that was going to, at that time, I couldn't speak for myself at that time. I needed him to step in and speak for me and yeah. basically save me if it came down to that. Yeah. Because they, I heard that they were very upset. <laughs> And um, uh, one of the guys pulled the knife out on me. And um, yeah, at that time. So, um, and as a result of going to my old friend, which I knew him since I was 10 years old yeah. from Howard yeah. Beach, um, nothing ever became of that. So in reality, I probably really didn't mean even have to go to him, but I just, I did it for both myself and Anthony. Now I start staying with Joey again. Oh. And the more I stay with Joey, Joey now takes me to Staten Island to meet Big John, who Big John is, is the skipper of the crew, okay. John Cas Casalucci. Okay. And, and now, now, years ago, and I'm talking about when I was a young guy, had this same event these these events taking place and let's just go back to the 80s and now joey brings me to his skipper he probably would have never probably brought me right to his skipper right yeah and it was they were more careful about what they what they did back then and a guy couldn't just come in meet the skipper and hang around you know 
for less than a year and get straightened out. Yeah. It just wasn't happening that way, right? But being John the way he was, John, when he found out that Anthony and myself were away for that length of time and, 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 and it was both violent crimes, he wanted to build himself up as a captain and, and, and um, you know, who better? to bring it and so he wants so, so I, get, I get it so you got you got kind of fast tracked you were you know you went away for a long time uh um the, your your manslaughter situation was that organized crime related or was that a separate issue no nothing to do with organized okay crime. so when you went you were you were in jail was it federal or state state okay did you serve with organized crime guys in state yes all right one of the things that we're always fascinated, and I get like a lot of private messages, public messages, et cetera. Do you get any preferential treatment or, you know, like Gene Brello said, even in state, which state is rough, the fact that he was an Italian kid, he went in kind of before he was hooked up, then after he was hooked up, they always kind of looked at Italians as like automatically being hooked up because they're there. And number two, not deference is probably not the right word, but treated with a certain level of respect. Did you kind of get that respect in state or did it not matter who the hell you were and you were fighting every day? Walk, walk us through your stint in jail before we go back to your oh, time in this jail. It's, it's, first of all, it's, it's not, um, I, don't, I don't believe that to be the case. Um, I was never in federal prison, maybe, maybe in federal prison, yeah. but there, you have a handful of people, if they hear your name ends in a vowel, they, yeah. they'll hit around with you and they'll make reference to the mob or whatever may be the case. But, you know, there was, there was a saying that we had in there. And it was, you know, back then in the 80s and 90s, people were wearing pinky rings, right? And they would say that you check your pinky ring in at the gate. Uh, and that went for everybody. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter if you were a friend, if you yeah. were an associate. So you kind of had to hold your own in there. I didn't really see any preferential treatment yeah. uh, to anybody because yeah. you're kind of all equal being locked up in the same place you know i don't i don't i don't think that was the case at least i didn't see it where, where, where did you serve um i was in a few places but the bulk of my time was in fishkill uh, new now, york got it now now in in jail did you just gravitate towards like did you hang out with wise guys in jail and is that where you kind of, cause you don't just get, you know, I, I get how you went back to childhood friend. I get how you got like introduced quickly, but I'm yeah. guessing you probably hung out with some dudes that were connected. And then by virtue of that, that probably meant something when you went out. Cause I know there's another story you're going to tell me later about somebody who helped something in jail and leveraged it. We'll get to that in a little bit, but, but did that help you being in jail in that world? <sighs> It's, you know, you're judged, you're judged by the way you carry yourself. Got it. And, okay. and, and that's really the answer. And I guess that goes for in there and out here too. That's and true. that's, that's just, that's just the way it was. It wasn't that, um, um, someone seen so-and-so with uh, a, a guy that's a, a friend in there and, you know, because of that, if there's a problem, there's not a problem for this guy, you would still have a problem. <laughs> you, had to, you had to handle yourself. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so, so hold on, so let's get back. So, so you get out, John, you meet John Castellucci, who's a, is a captain, Correct. and you get introduced, introduced. So give me kind of what happens and what happens next. Um, well, there was an incident again in the restaurant, and okay. it was right before, right before I met John. So let's just say two days before Joey takes me to John, there's another incident. I'm in the restaurant. Anthony Guzzo is not there. And the, which, which winds up becoming his wife, who was the owner. She becomes his wife later on. But at the time, it's his girl. And her son comes to me and tells me that there's a guy acting up in there. And he's another, <laughs> it was crazy because every, everybody in that restaurant were big, uh, you know, another big monster guy. Big, big guy. And he was there. And, it, and his brother-in-law was a Staten Island guy who I didn't know either one of them. And I went over to talk to the brother-in-law and just basically told him, tell your brother-in-law to calm himself down or he's going to wind up getting hurt. And he went, it's funny because he goes outside 
this guy and makes a telephone call and wants me to hear of all people who he's calling. He's calling Big John. Oh, and he says, hey, Big John. Yes, we, <laughs> um, I'm standing there laughing because Joey tells me tomorrow we're going to go to Staten Island. <laughs> so I'm saying, look at this shit. So, yeah. So anyway, John calls up Joey and says, do me a favor. Uh, your friend John is in this place and tell him not to put his hands on this kid. He's my cousin, which he's not his cousin. Yeah. And Italian, you know, Italians, everybody's a cousin. Yeah. Everybody's a cousin. Right. So Joey calls me right away and says, where are you? And I tell him I'm, I'm in a restaurant. He says, do me a favor. John. Don't hit this guy. He says, this guy, John, called. I says, I'm not going to do it, but he's got to tell, you know, I want to tell him is the, the, the brother-in-law is out of hand. Yeah. And, and he's getting out of hand. So anyway, I go over to the guy and I say, listen, you just made a telephone call. I just got a call and I need you to go to your brother-in-law and tell him that he cannot act up in this place. And that's what I want you to do right now. And everything's going to be fine. That's what I need you to do. And he yeah. did it. And he, he admitted, he says, he's very drunk. He says, my brother-in-law's Greek. And not that that meant anything. And, and, you know, I'll talk to him and his wife's trying to, and I was, I was even more aggravated. I said, you mean his wife is in it? Yeah. He's got his, <laughs> and his daughter, he had a little daughter. Oh, so they wind up taking the brother-in-law out. So now the guy's name was Pete and he says, I want to buy you a drink. And I said, no, no, no. Cause you know, we, we were very, we went this place all the time. I said, no, no, Pete, come on, have a drink with me. Yeah. And he had a drink and that was the end of that. So when Joey takes me the next day to meet John, they had to go take a ride to Maspit to meet Maddie Madonna. Oh. And, and Joey didn't know that. So we jump in Joey's truck. We go there, we meet John. And Joey said, you know, well, what do you want to do? He says, take him with us. And on the way there, the first words out of, john's mouth to me he says so you're the guy that was looking to lump my cousin up so uh, i said <laughs> i said yes i am nice to meet you so that's how that's how we wind up meeting Real quick, and then we so your boy guzzo's place right um one of the things and and i know it's not maybe common throughout the rest of the country it's odd we get like a lot of listeners from like all over the country, like randomly in Oregon, we do, we do real well. So, but just kind of being in New York and New Jersey, generally when you go to a place, generally, if you're somewhat in the know, you know if it's somebody's place. And number two is if it's somebody's place, you generally don't fuck around, right? Um, you know, I mean, if like, you're smart enough, yeah. Yeah, so was your, was your guy Guzzo's place considered kind of a protected place and they were kind of pissing on it or he wasn't connected enough and it wasn't known to be like kind of a wise guy's joint. The later. The at latter, that point latter. in time, yeah, at, yeah. At that point in time, it was not, it was not known as, you know, a place that you should. Okay. So let's, let's, let's get to the good stuff, John. So you meet, okay. So at this point you're kind of getting in, right? So, so I want to know like the, those pivot points, right? So, like, now you kind of get introduced to the right people, right? And Matthew Madonna is, like, a the boss back then. I didn't, uh, I didn't meet him. No, no, I'm not saying you. I know they were meeting him. But what I'm saying yeah. is you're getting a kind of the upper echelon of the Lucchese family, which, you know, I got to be honest with you. We talked about this earlier. Of the five families, and we could do a whole other podcast on that, but of the five families, it's arguably the reign that Casso and Musso had was arguably one of the most ruthless and least covered. Like whoever was in the PR for the for the for the Lucchese family just was not good because Lucchese's I, I would be more look I'd be more scared if I'm in New Jersey of the Lucchese's than even during the Gotti era, with all due respect, because yeah. they were killing everyone back then yeah. and just over stupid shit. So anyway, so okay, so you kind of get him back in. Give us like your first, you know, like did you have a job? And then what were your first few assignments that you could speak of that you started having to kind of do to get reacclimated or acclimated into your journey to becoming a made man? Um, well, one of the first things was that, um, unfortunately, and it is unfortunate, um, John's uh, son, okay. his uh, nickname was Sonny, um, unfortunately got himself addicted to drugs and um he had tried to get him in different rehabs and um 
you know, there was a time when I was in the car with John and a number came up on an unknown num- number came up on the phone and he was a little hesitant to answer it and he answered it and he took the call and, you know, but you could see that something was wrong with him. And then he got off the call and he said, ah, it was nothing. I said, you're all right. He says, yeah, I don't like them calls. He said, because I, I, I worry it's going to be about my son. Now being a father myself, yeah. I never forgot that. So when the kid came one time, he was one of his stints. He came out from rehab. I grabbed him. I said, come here, I want to, I want to talk to you. Take a walk with me. And, um, and I talked to him. And I said, you know, I want to tell you something. And I, 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 re- I, relate, I, I told him that whole story. I said, you know, I said, so I don't know if you understand, you know, what you're doing is affecting your father where the guy don't even want to answer. He's worried about picking up a phone call and God forbid your dad or in jail. You know, that's not good what you're doing. And, you know, I, I'm not here to tell you what to do. This is your life. But I know that you could do so much better and you can help yourself. And, you know, you need to try to help yourself and get yourself clean. And his best friend was up John's ass. And I tried to get in, the, in his head that way. I said, you know, here's your friend. He's up your father's ass and he wants to run around with your father. He wants everybody to see, you know, he, he, him to be seen with your father. And here's, here's the bottom line. That's your father. That's not his father. And, you know, it would be nice that you, you go and spend time with your father. Because yeah. your father's spending time with your best friend. <laughs> and, and this kid was a nice kid and he was very respectful. He thanked me. Yeah. He said to me, Hey, you know, I really want, you know, most kids, they don't want to, you know, who that for you. And I don't want to hear yeah. what you have to say. He thanked me. He said, I, I want to thank you, you know, for, for taking the time to pull me to the side and talk to me. When I walked away from him, I, I felt bad because I knew it really felt, fell on deaf ears. And I knew there was going to be two outcomes for him. And unfortunately it was the worst outcome because he wanted to pass it away yeah, in Rikers that. Island. But so what took place, what I'm talking about is that John had come to me and told me that on one of the kids last stints that he did in rehab, he was starting to do good. Yeah. And John found out that a Spanish guy that lived on a kid's block started selling him drugs again. Hey. So he said to me, I want you to go and crack this guy and tell him to stay away from my son. Yeah. And I'll just give you an example of the time. I don't remember what time it was. Let's just say it was 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Yes. At one o'clock, I was already reporting back that we took care of it already. That's how quick it was done. But, so what's take care of you? Just like lumped him up a little bit or, or what? Uh, yeah. Anthony and myself located him and was and he like was he like hey listen man like i'm sorry i won't do it he or- tried to say he tried to, i said something to him and he tried to go to say something and didn't get to say it, <laughs> got you it. Yeah. he was he was getting lumped up got it so you report back got it what happened what happened <laughs> It was an hour later and, you know, he was thrilled to death that an hour later it was already done yeah. because in that life, that's what, you know, you don't want to tell a guy, Hey, so kind of like testing you to say, go do this. Right. And then it doesn't get done or whatever may be the case, but it was an hour later and it was done and taken care of. Did so that, that, was did that, guy, did that guy wind up obeying and the kid found it from like another source or did this guy ignore your threats? I think that guy was going to move off the block. <laughs> I don't, I'm only kidding. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't mean to laugh. Um, it should be funny to be honest. Yeah. With you. I don't know um, what took place after that. Did he yeah. continue? Did they do it on a sneak? I mean, how do we really stop that? Sure. You know, true, um, true. But, but okay. Um, so you did your job to build up some credibility. So let's, let's kind of give that to the, to the building a trust column. So you're so, starting, to, so you're starting to do stuff, right? Like, yeah. like as an associate, because you went from kind of being a regular guy to an associate, and then we'll get to a made guy once we'll go through that process when, when yeah. we reach it. Yeah. What does it mean? Like, you start making more money, you get more opportunities. I, I want to. Well, like, no, what it's like listen. Up, what does it mean? You know? No, it well, it doesn't really mean much. It just means that you once again 
it's like any, it's like, if, if it's like a person starting a new job, yeah. you know, what's going to become of them on that job is what they put into it, what they bring to it, what they, you know, what they could produce in their job. And, and, you know, so at that point, it's not that someone's going to come to you and say, here, you're going to be in charge of this now, or you're going to be making this amount of money, or here's this money and go put it on the street. It yeah. does, it's, that's not the way things, things happen. Got it. And so I um, started, uh, you know, with a small half sheet, which, which, which is, which for anybody that doesn't know is a sports business where you would go on a half sheet with the guys who are running the sports business and you would get a percentage. And if, if, if the person lost and if the person won, now that puts you in the red, which means the next time if the person loses and your percentage coming to you, you would have to first take care of, you know, what you're in the red for and then so on and so forth. So I went on the half sheet and it was very small. It was not nothing, you know, we're not talking major money, you know, a couple of guys gambling and betting and really pocket, really pocket money. If you really yeah. want, you know, if you want to be honest. And but, um, but, but it's, but this is all part of an odd, like, let's be candid. It, it was, it, it was kind of weird because as you know, with by 13, um, and I don't know what time, and, and we're, I'm guessing we're close to 13 at this point, but, yeah. but on one end, like the mob wasn't making anybody because like there was so worried about, you know, you know, um, informants and just technology and so forth. But the same token, their ranks were like steadfastly being depleted that if they didn't hire, you know, new people or bring in new people, then they would be extinct. So for you to kind of even be considered and you to even make it this far in that world, as I understand it, you know, better than me is kind of a big deal. So, so let's, let's fast forward a little bit more. So, 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 so you, you were, you, I trust that you built credibility with these guys. Um, and then reading from online, you kind of got mixed up in something where you were due to be made, but they may have, have expedited it for you to protect you. Is there any truth to that? Correct. Yes. Okay. Go, let's, let's cut to that. If that's okay. John. I don't mean to, okay. I don't mean no, to no, no, no. move you along. I only, no, cause no. Like, we have a lot to cover and no, I want fine. to make sure that we get to the, you know, some of the fun stuff. So what, well, it wasn't that fun. So <laughs> don't, that, that day was St. Joseph's day. And, um, we had been invited to a St. Joseph's dinner in okay. Long Island and, um, we got together and we decided to go and we took a group, a group of guys and um, uh, with uh, my friend Joey, Vic, uh, uh, Vic Amuso, son-in-law being one of, one of them, um, Anthony, myself, and a couple of other guys. And one of the guys was, was the, uh, the girl, the, um, he wanted to get married, I told you, to the owner of the restaurant, yeah. her son. Yeah. He invited her, him, him along. And after the dinner, which we should, we, they took, we took a limo, you know, and we, <laughs> oh, we, we all, well, because only because of, uh, no, 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 I get it. And, and it's funny. Cause it's kind of like on one end, when you picture mob guys, you figure like, you know, knots of cash, limos, grimaz, all that it, other stuff. Right? Yeah. It but was on the other it, end, like, it's supposed to be secret. <laughs> no, no, it was nothing. Um, nothing flashy. That. I got it. it I got really, it. no, no, not that the car wasn't flashy. Yeah. It, it, it just was really, because we wanted to drink and didn't want to drive. That got, was it, a, got it, got it. The responsible, the responsible mafioso. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, we don't want to get pinched for the DWI. So, exactly. <laughs> so we we go to we go to the restaurant and yeah. we have a nice. And there was at this dinner there was guys from every borough, okay. every borough, right? And we're socializing with everybody and having dinner with them and drinking. And we, and by the way, we started drinking at like 11 o'clock in the afternoon because this was a lunch, a lunch. Yeah. And you know, and now we're there and it's getting late and we have drinking and eating and now the dinner is over. So what we should have did was get back in our limo and go back to our places and go home. They want, they, these guys wanted to go to a strip club and I really wasn't crazy about, about the strip clubs, but yeah. I wasn't going to, you know, protest. So we go to one place and by the way, a, a, a person that wasn't in our party as, and, and what I mean is in our limo 
also invited himself and he happened to be Philly Lucky's son. Philly Lucky is the guy, one of the three captains that gets blasted, you know, uh, in the basement of a meeting one time. I'm sure you know about that. Yeah. With the whole Joey Messini thing. Yeah. So it's his son and he is a knucklehead. (laughs) And I was not crazy about being in his company. I didn't like the way he talked and I just, but he invited himself and he picked this other place and we went to one place and everything was fine in this place. And it was empty. Don't forget it's still early and it was empty. And moving forward, he suggested another place and um, on Long Island. And because he wasn't in the car with us, he was taking his own car and he said, I'll meet you guys there. Well, our limo driver got lost. Uh-huh. And he gets there before us and unbeknown to us, because I know I can speak for myself. I would have never went into place had I known this. He goes over to the manager and they're just like opening up. And he tells the guy, my, my friends from Brooklyn are, are wise guys and they're coming to the place. Get the, get the women ready. Okay. Now, first of all is that wasn't true at the time because we were not. Yeah. And the only guy that was a friend with us was Joey. Yeah. And, you know, that's not the way you want to make an entrance into a place. And right. he had no, no business doing that. So we're already walking into something that's very bad and we don't even know it yet. Yeah. Because the place was once controlled by the Lucchese's, but now transitioned to the West side. And if anybody don't know what the West side yeah, is, that's it, right. Time. Yeah, well, we, we didn't call them that. We call them the West Side. Yeah. So we didn't know that at the time. So we're already walking into a bad situation. So we, we wind up going into place. And, you know, I was not mingling with, I just was at the, at the bar having, having a drink and everybody was socializing with these strippers and whatnot. And, you know, my, my take is a stripper's there to take, put our money, put a hand in your pocket, take your money. That's about it. She's not and, in taking out with you. I got it. Yeah. So, so I just was ha- having more drinks and um, what a couple of things took place that made things worse. One was one of the guys who would, I hear him, ask the the bartender whose plate now this is where it gets bad because it fits into what later took place who owns this place who got this place now he shouldn't be talking to a bartender about these things she was a a woman behind the bar and and she said i I don't know and he says well you you work here and he's going back and forth and i'm i hit him on the arm and told him like stop that like right but what she does is she goes and reports back to the manager who yeah. earlier speaks to Philly, who already made a telephone call. Right? I'll be north of us. So it, this gets worse and worse and worse. And then Philly, you know, uh, Phil Lucky's son, yeah. I hear him tell a, 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 a stripper at this point, how would you like me to punch you in your face? I guess he tried to. Now, here's, the, here's one of the reasons why I didn't want to be around this guy. And I go over to Anthony and I said, listen, I got to talk to you. Philly just told one of the strippers, how would you like me to punch you in your face? We need to get out of here. I'm telling you, because he's causing a scene. And Anthony's saying, ah, that's just him. You know, he whacked out of his mind. And he didn't, he didn't pay it no mind. Yeah. And I go back and, and remember, we're the only ones in this place. But really, and I'm quick, having- uh, really quick though, John, um, because you were with one guy that was straightened out or was, was a member, isn't like by like, um, like maybe I'm disillusioned. So you're welcome to call me an idiot. No. But my understanding, once you're a made guy, you kind of went through a certain pedigree. You're not like a low level dude. You're like a serious guy. Like you're not right. like you might go to a strip club and you may party. But like you're not fucking around, like you're not doing stupid shit. You don't need to do stupid shit. Correct. So like if you're with a guy who's who's made, wouldn't the other guys around him by I guess by transference, if you will, act right because well, you're with them or no? Well, remember something. So and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. Yeah. I was the only one with Joey at the time, and I was acting right. Got it. These guys wasn't with Joey. Well, Anthony was. Yeah. And Anthony wasn't really doing anything wrong. He was with some stripper. Um, and and um, what happens is, is that I notice all of a sudden we're not the only guys in the strip club anymore. Yeah. And 
these guys are crewed up. There's like three, four over here and two over here nice. and four over here. And I noticed two guys that are standing there. And, you know, as we say, I, at that point, I'm not straightened out, but in the street, you know, who's who just by, I don't know. You could just, you just know, you know, right. And I'm looking at one guy and I'm saying, this is not good. So I go over to Anthony and I said, Anthony, <laughs> Listen to I, me. Like, I like it because all your stories have historically been, this guy is nobody. But in this particular case, your radar was like, oh, shit, these are somebody. I don't exactly. even laugh, but it just, no, I like that. You know. Yeah. So I go over to him and I said, listen, we got a problem. Yeah. Look around. I'm telling you something's going down. I said, you need to, first of all, stop drinking <laughs> and, yeah. and, and let's get together and let's round everybody up because yeah. – you know, something's happening. What are you talking about? You're paranoid. You know, everybody loves to yeah. say I'm paranoid. I'm like, yeah. are you paranoid? Are you getting paranoid? So um, I was going to go on my own and approach these two guys, yeah. you know, the ones who look like they were kind of shock wounds. Yeah. But I decided against it. And then at the last minute, there seemed to be a rumble going out of the club. Everybody's piling out of the club towards the parking lot. Yeah. So, of course, I go out. And I go over to these two guys now because I see that there's an argument going on between yeah. Anthony's future stepson and, yeah. and the bounces and it's, things are not looking good. Yeah. And now at this point, there's like 20 something guys out there to yeah. all five or whatever we were. Yeah. And except Vic's son is in another part of the club. Yeah. You know, so we, and I don't he, even know where he, he is. He's probably the highest ranking guy there on your squad. He is, and he doesn't even know what's going on at this point. Got it. And he's not even outside. He's probably he's like lap dances or something. Got it. I didn't want to say that. Or whatever. But, I, don't, I don't know. So, about it. I, I don't know. I don't need. I don't need. I don't need to get a knock on the door. So, 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 so what the Bible. Happens, I don't know. Who knows? What, what happens is, is that I go and approach these two guys, and when I approach them, we introduce. And when I say introduce ourselves, we just in other words, listen. My name's John, and he says. I'm Ralphie and the other guy said, my name's Jamie. And what I don't know at the time is that Ralphie is a Ralphie Bosamo, who's a skipper captain with the West side. Oh shit. And Jamie is with the West side, but on the shelf, yeah. meaning on the shelf is meaning that he is no longer active. His family put him on the shelf. So, but I don't know this at the time. And I have so a conversation. You're talking, so you're essentially talking to a captain, but don't even know it. Correct. And later on, he makes a statement that I spoke out of school. I did not. I basically said to him, I said, listen, you know, what's, what's, what's going on over here? And he says, well, you and your friends are looking to make a move on the place. So what they thought was that we were coming to cause trouble, which, which is something that goes on sometimes when they want to shake a place down, they go into a place, they get loud in a restaurant, they start causing scenes because what does that do to business? It, it, you know, and, and then, then at that say, point, oh, by the way, do you need protection? Hey, pay us and we got you. Yeah. Otherwise we're going to come in here and do this every night. Right. But that, that is not why we were there, obviously. Right. And, but on, remember, I don't know that Philly makes statements like this early in the night. I don't even know this. I find this out later. And oh, so shit. With, oh, shit. Yes. Wait, wait, it just registered. So yes. you went to like a wise guy's place. He yes. like he said, "Hey, we're wise guys." So either way, this is not good, right? Number yes. one, either if you are a wise guy, you broke protocol. We don't say things like that. that. And number yes. two, it's even worse if you purport yourself of a wise guy. In yep. some cases, can be sentenced by death. Oh, yes. Yeah, so that okay. that's what's that's what's going on, and, and and it is a perfect storm that's going on, and <laughs> and so I say to him, "Listen, that's first of all, that's not what's going on." go check with your barmaids and go look at, because one of the things we would do is not we, but you know, one of the things that you would do is you're not going to pay the tab either. <laughs> if yeah. you're looking to shake a place up, you're not paying the tab. Correct, I said, correct. go look at the registers and see how much money we spent here and that we're paying. That's not yeah. what's happening. So he kind of understood that. And he kind of understood also that I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So he turns around and says to me, which he's tickling the wire. He says to me, you know, John, you seem to be and talk like a gentleman. I said, and I always try to be, Ralphie. Was that, so, was that cue for are you a made guy? 
He's not ever going to say that, but I think he's trying to put a feel around there to say, you know, he's trying to get me into some kind of a, a, a dialogue with him. Yeah. So I said to him, look, there's not much more you and I can say to each other, but don't worry about it. I'm going to get these guys out of here. Now he gets a little stupid and gets cocky. He says, let me tell you something. We're not worried about not. And, you know, I dealt with these kind of guys all my life. And so I just tell him we're not worried either. <laughs> like, you know, there's no reason to be, yeah. What are we, we're not going to stand here and say, I'm tougher than you. My guys are tougher than you. It's, that's like childish to do. Yeah. So, but at that point, when wait, I'm- Wait, 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 wait. Were, they, were they from Brooklyn? No, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> so at that point, I was going to turn around and say, pack it up, let's go. Yeah. And someone threw a punch. Oh, Jesus. So now, and I just want to say this before, because I find that, very very funny that i'll say what i say and i'll get back to that punch yeah i was blamed later on well let me just tell a story it's just better yeah. this way so so what happens is is that all hell breaks loose i even see ralphie get punched in the face uh, okay right? uh, oh, uh, oh. oh yeah well at that in, in a fight when no one knows who he is he doesn't matter who he is he's getting punched in the face yeah. he gets cracked in the face and i'm saying this is insanity right yeah. now i tell you as i as I talk to you today, yeah, and you know, here's 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 what people, here's what was said later on. Later on, it was said that, oh well, he didn't throw, he didn't pick his hands up. Now, here I'll tell you what happened. Everybody's fighting, right? And my friends are fighting. Now, when I go to go and approach somebody, oh by the way, I, I left the important thing out. Right before the punch is thrown, Ralphie gets all these guys together and he's talking to them in a group, right? Yeah. And they turn around and look over at me. So it has always been my belief and still is to this day that at that point, Ralphie believes that I'm a friend and he's yeah. telling them, don't touch him because what happens, what transpires after that makes no sense at all. Now I got blamed that I didn't pick my hands up in during this scuffle, right? Yeah. This melee. Now, every time I went to go over to somebody to pick my hands up, they would go in a different direction. So it was like I was – it was impossible. Even if I wanted to throw a punch at somebody, they wouldn't – So hold on. So I, I, I get that part. Where is your buddy that did have his button that was in the back? Did he come out at this point or he didn't come no, out yet? No, and it's a big part of the story because – So what happens is that they move so quick, these guys, and they also had some of these things where – you notice. I don't know what they call it, but it's this black thing that clicks out with a ball on top. It's like a baton. Like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. And they moved so quick, and I'm not kidding you, because they don't forget to all five guys that were out there, and there was over 18 to 20 of them. Damn. Everybody was on the floor except me. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah, and sure. everybody, everybody took off. I was standing literally with the limo parked in front of me, and five bodies or four bodies laying all over the floor by myself. And I went to go run past Anthony's uh, stepson who, who decided to wear clogs with his suit. Don't ask me why. And that's how I think he, he winds up getting a compound fracture and he's on the floor, but he's a big heavy guy calling for me to help him. I don't want to lift him up and do further damage because I know I can't lift him. I'm going to get Anthony up. Yeah. And Anthony's out cold, completely out cold, knocked out. And I'm telling him, Anthony, get up, Anthony, get up. And what do you mean? He's out I, drunk? No, no, no. Banged out. Everybody was. No, no, out. but the guy, the, the, who was the name of the guy who was a made guy, Vic Amuso's. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Vic, Vic, he's son, Vic Amuso's son in law, Joey's inside. He do not even know any of this. Happened. Why did you go run and get him? I ran, went running and get Anthony. Got it. A Anthony's on the floor. Got it. Not, got it. Not, Joey's inside. Got it. So I go to Anthony and I'm getting Anthony up, telling him to wake up, wake up. He's asking me, well, he didn't even know what happened. What happened? I says, Anthony, it's bad. You, they banged you up. And, and I, I don't have one scratch on me, nothing at this point. And, um, and now everybody else is getting up and we get the kid up and his foot is literally hanging off the bone sticking out. Mm. And um, they want to now get him to a hospital. He's crying. He's in a lot of pain and yeah. he's crying. And, we're going to go in the limo and it hits me. Oh shit. Joey's inside. Yeah. Now 
Now, this guy, Ralphie, and all these guys took off. They're gone. But who's left is this guy, Jamie, and the bouncers. Yeah. So I go running over to the door, and they stand in front of me, and they're blocking me. So I tell the guy, point in his face, this Jamie. I says, let me tell you something. You just made a big mistake, number one. And this is not going to be the end of this. And I'm coming in, going in to get my friend. I'm either going to walk in or I'm going to work my way in there. You make a decision. And he tells the guys, get out of his way. Uh, thankfully for me, they would have lumped me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like six pounds. At this point, they think your, your, um, your, your feathers are a little bit more fluffier than they were. And they were. Exactly. So they get out of my way. And I go find Joey and, and, and get him. And I tell, he says, what, what's going on? I said, Joey, Joey, you're not going to believe what happened, but let's go. I got to get you out of here. Now, when we're leaving the place, one of the bouncers, who happens to be the biggest one, of course, yeah. is laughing because one of the guys is picking himself back up off the floor. These guys, everybody was banged up. Yeah, yeah. And I'm coming out and I'm saying to myself, I'm going to make this guy laugh. He's a bouncer. And he's going to laugh at just what just happened. So I don't say nothing to Joey. I hit the bouncer on the way out. <laughs> and Joey goes back to back with me immediately. And we start fighting with the bouncers. Holy shit. And I mean, we did okay. And what I say by okay is we both take a couple of shots. Yeah. And um, I hurt my hand. And Joey gets hit on the side of his head. And I get hit in the side of my cheek. And... But we hold our own with them for a little yeah. bit, and then more people come and they break it up, and then we go to the limo and we go right to and the. Get the hell out of there, yeah. Yes. Now, what? What to speed it up? I mean, there's a whole another story at the hospital. I'm going to skip over that. Yeah. To speed things up, what happens is is that all hell breaks loose because now they is a whole there's a whole investigation on what the hell happened, <laughs> here. and we get called in to the club in the Bronx. Oh shit. And on the way there, Joey turns to me right when we're getting out of the car. Not on the way there, but when we're getting out of the car, and we're getting, we only got 100 feet to go into this place, says, do me a favor. you got to do all the talking. You're a better talker than me. And I, I'm stuck right now because I don't want to be, you know, don't forget. Why, I, why were you sent for as an associate? Isn't that meant to be, aren't sit-downs meant to be amongst captains and soldiers? This was uh, a get to the bottom of what happened. Okay, it wasn't uh, a sit down guy. Okay, yeah. Yes, it was. It was get in here and explain what took place last night. That's okay. that's what that was. Yeah. And I walk in, and the administration is sitting there. <laughs> and yes, and um, and several people, and all eyes are on me. And I explain what Wait, happened. We're, we're, we're in the Bronx, uh, 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 Morris Park, or what part of the Bronx? Uh, on Tremont Avenue. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Throg's Neck, yeah, yeah. Correct. And uh, I, think, I think that's Throg's Neck. I, I don't know. Uh, and um, so I'm asked to explain, and, and every once in a while I'm being stopped and asked, you know, a side question, and I'm answering. And so what we find out is that we find out exactly and get told right on the spot. Don't forget, I'm only an associate at this point. And uh, Ralphie's Ralph, Ralphie Basamo, he's a skipper with the West Side. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God. And, <laughs> and you know, we're learning what took place. And they said that they have a list of your names and your name is at the top. <laughs> they, my, they had a list of our names. And so what, what they did is creatively, the only way to get me in trouble, I guess they, they assumed, like, like I said, that this Ralphie assumed that I was a friend. So what he turns around, I guess because he's pissed because they would have probably did damage to me. Because at that point, Tom, who's going to stop? Unless I went and hid underneath the limo or I ran away, who is going to stop these guys? from banging me up too. They knocked everybody out except me. Why, why correct, would they correct, do that? Correct. So how is that my fault? That, you know what I mean? I had no, correct. there was no way for me. But anyway. I, I, hate, I hate to say this, John, but I'm yeah. just like thinking, I'm just going by your words. Yeah. If I heard this story. Yes. And, and, and you saw me from wrong, but in like the mob world, being a soldier is a very big deal. It's miles away from being an associate. Correct. But being a captain from a soldier is like being 
thousand, it's like, it's not like a simple like promotion. It's a big fucking deal, right? So, so, so just at, at, at what you're saying, right? Mm-hmm. It kind of implies whether you inferred it or not that you basically said you had your button. I'm just giving you because because it's exemplified in the actions from this guy Ralph. He did exactly what you probably said. Hey, don't touch this guy. He he's with us. The other guys lumped him up, right? Yes, yes. So so now whether now whether now whether you said it, which I don't think you do. You're not an idiot. Or yep. he inferred it. Either way. I hate to say this, but you're going in there cold in a way. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, so what happened next? So what happens is, is that they bring this up of what he said. Yikes. And it's Stevie Crea that says it at the time. And he said, I just want you to know that from what you told me and what he told me you said, you did nothing wrong. He says, and I also told him, and now this part I didn't know, that, and this is the first time that you would, I don't know if they've, usually would tell people this but he said i told him well his name is going around which means that you are being proposed and your name is circulating through new york and your name's going around on a piece of paper and with that being said he could say anything he wanted to you is what he oh told wait a second wait a second so you got into like a, a skirmish or skirmish at a, at his place and then separately being a captain he saw that note and then no no, okay, no, no, okay, no. Got it, okay. He was told got it. By, by Stevie, we are, are doing something for him. Got it. And meaning that they're proposing me and my name is going around. So he basically told him, so basically he could talk to me any way he wants. Got it. And that was the end of that. Now, now to jump a little bit, three oh, weeks. Oh, oh, so real quick, so what was... Did you have to pay money? Did you like just your punishment was not to get like no 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 we didn't get not get killed no, like what, what no 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 yeah. there was no punishment okay all right and it was no money it was nothing like that yeah. there was a ring uh, according to Anthony Guzzo they took the kid and that his uh, stepson's ring was worth ten thousand dollars and there was that brought up that we want the ring back but it was stressed to us at that point we are letting you know that there is no retaliation whatsoever. And Maddie brought up a good point. And he said, you know, they tried to say that we sent you there to shake the place down. And I told them, if we sent them there to shake this place down, that place down, and they showed up with suits and a limousine, they would be leaving in a hearse. Meaning that's not the way you go and shake a place down, you know, Correct. bring that much attention to yourself. Correct. And, and it's the truth. And they should have known that. That's not, we wouldn't come in there like that. <laughs> now, did your, you know? did your guy, Joe, being, being a member at the time, did he get like kind of in trouble because of the, the, what happened with your crew or it, it was just a big misunderstanding? It was, no, he had no trouble at all. And it, and it was. Okay. It so was, this, but this actually, so, so to bring it back to my question, this actually in a weird way expedited your making process, correct? Oh, well, 100% did. And all right, so, reason, so, yeah, yeah, I got to give it to this, John. This is, I'm, I'm, I got the hairs in the back of my neck. Yes. So hear about the ceremony. Basically, basically this process happens two times a year. It's yeah. not written in stone, but it's, it's happens at some time, June or July, and then Christmas time. Interesting. Right? It's two, two different times a year that this takes place. As you know, this happened in, um, I think, uh, was it, I don't know the correct date of uh, St. Joseph's, but I believe it's some kind, it's sometime in, is it April or February? I forget. I forget. I think it's in April. March? My no. son's name is Giuseppe and I do celebrate. Is it March? With, um, it may be in March, red. but we get straightened uh, down in April. I should know but, this because this is his name day. March 19th. I thought it was in April. Okay. So we get straightened out April 2nd. And the reason being is because three weeks later, they try to come back, they deliver the ring back, right? And now that they can't, you know, and I've been told this by many people that the West Side will lie and twist the story to always make themselves right. And being that they couldn't get me on misrepresenting myself, right? Because here we are, here we have the underboss of the family saying, 
Absolutely not. He didn't say anything out of place, out of order. And anything he said, he could have said because his name is on the list for us to, for us to straighten him out. And so what did they do three weeks later? Come back with the ring and turn around, or two weeks later, and come back and turn around and say, oh, by the way, that guy never picked his hands up one time. Now, <laughs> why did you say that when you, why did you say that on the next day when you had a meeting and said, Hey, this guy misrepresented himself. So I turn around, John, big John wants to come and say, you know, it's an embarrassment. I said, John, let me tell you something. Go get, go get, it's their joint, right? Tell them to pull the videotapes from the cameras yeah. and take a look. Why don't you go, why don't you go play the videotape and see what took place there and you'll, you'll understand it. Any, anytime I went to go over to somebody to pick my hands up, they went in another direction. I can't help that. Wait, so and, hold on. So hold on. Did John go to you to the meet? You said, uh, jo did John or Joe with you go to, who went to the meeting with you with, with the administration? Uh, Joey came with me. John was there already. Was there already. Cause he, he was in, he was in management. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so hold on. So, so now <laughs> he was, in now, management. You know, so, yeah. so now hold on. Did you know, like you were, did you know, like, cause I know you hear both sides. One, they're like, Hey, dress up. We're going for dinner Saturday. And you're like, oh, I know what's coming. And the other end, it's a complete surprise. Did you know you were getting made April 2nd? Um, uh, but days before, um, Johnny Sideburns had come to me, all right? And he was a friend with us in our crew. And he said, listen to me, keep your nose clean in this, the next couple of days. So I says, what are you talking about? <laughs> he says, don't get in any more trouble. You're in enough trouble. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. we just had this big incident. He says, just stay quiet. He says, don't get in any trouble with these knuckleheads out here drinking. He says, because we were, we were always in Staten Island drinking. Yeah. He said, and just take it from me. So he never actually told me, but if you're in the street, you understand that. And then um, I got a telephone call to meet with uh, little Joey, who's Vic's um, son-in-law. And it was no, it was nothing like, hey, uh, which it's funny because I just came across something about this where somebody's telling somebody to dress up. It's none of that. It was just, hey, uh, do me a favor. We got to go take a ride. Come and meet me. Yeah. So I kind of knew from two days prior with speaking with Johnny Sideburns that I kind of knew what it was. Got it. Now, now hold on. So I want, I want to give deeper context because a lot of why you're a special, you're a special guest for many reasons, but whether we like it or not, the media, there's not that many made guys out there or former made guys out there doing interviews that are relevant past 2010, maybe even past 2000, right? Okay, so we had a, a quick piece of technical difficulty. Um, for those who listen to the podcast, we do live recruit. Um, I don't do any editing by design. I just want a real and raw conversation. Um, but that being said, um, I want to kind of go where I left off, uh, which was, so John, um, why did the Lucchese's want to make you? We're going to get to the making ceremony, that kind of stuff. But like, why do they want to make you? And then what did it mean to you to be a made guy? Um, do you mean why did they want to do it so quickly or? Well, we got to do it so quickly because the scuffle, but yes. then you were obviously important to them. Why were you so important to them? That's what I want to get. I want to get a feel for the audience. I just, why. I just, I just believe that at that time, and we're going back to 2013, that it, you know, finding guys for the life is 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 a is a difficult task it's not easy yeah. you know it's not like they there's not a whole people don't understand there's not a whole lot of guys out there that you know and we've had this discussion amongst each other that that even the younger guys that we would want to bring in and and um i wasn't a younger guy at this time either you know i, I was in my 40s and, and Anthony was older than myself. Um, 
and so that that that's probably the reason i i don't know the reasons why they want to be you know that's what i could you know come up with myself is that that we've done a lot of time um we were both known from our our, our neighborhoods of uh, people spoke highly of us and you know there was a time when i went and met everybody at the club and i don't want to call it an interview but i was sitting down and all eyes were on me they they were you know um going back and talking back and forth with me and they want to see how you answer how you carry yourself you know and how you act you know all these things uh, are important to them and they want to see that if you're kind of a good fit for them got it okay know? so they really wanted you so walk us through uh the day of man i'm gonna let's get the drum roll um yeah so on that day i kind of played a little joke on anthony Cusso. i he had called and i says i hope you're not wearing a suit and he says of course i am why i said no they don't do that anymore don't you're gonna embarrass yourself and anyway i showed up in a suit and <laughs> he, he was cursing me i said come on you got time go upstairs and change but he didn't want it he had dress pants and a sweatshirt a sweater on and um uh, and anyway, so we, we, we went to a diner yeah. in, in Staten Island. And, um, and this is all, you know, this has all been transcribed already. Um, and we, uh, after we ate breakfast, we met up with um, John's brother, Spanky, is, uh, is another, friend in, in, uh, another friend with us. And we um, jumped in his car. And we were very crammed because they were bringing a guy to get straightened out too from another crew. And there was three of us. And then there was Joey and Spanky and we were all crammed in this car and the guy had just a leg injury. So it, it was a mess. And we had jumped on uh, one of the parkways and then jumped off an exit, jumped on and off. We, we were making sure that no law enforcement tails were on us. But obviously you don't want to bring, law enforcement to somewhere where the administration is going to be holding a ceremony. Right. And at that point we were ushered into a house and um, down into the basement. And in the basement were three chairs and we each took a chair and they says, you know, we'll call you up, you know, give us a little, little time. And you heard people, up there and shuffling around and we didn't know who was there really that's the truth at that point we didn't know who was up there and how many people and um they called the first guy and anthony and i didn't know him we had just met him and they called him up first and he was up there for about i don't know 20 25 minutes you know and then um Something took place. I'm not going to say what it was because I want to save it for another time. But something took place where Anthony was very, very nervous. He turned white as a ghost. Something happened down there. And I said to myself, oh, God, I, I kept the joke going and I didn't want to tell him. And I said, I hope they call him next because he's going to have a heart attack down here. And then just as I said that, there was a knock on the door and they said, John, come up. <laughs> so I left him down. I thought we were going to find them with rigor mortis down here. So, um, and um, I, I, I walked into a living, a dining room and there was a long dining room table and everyone was sitting at that table at that point. No one was talking <laughs> and there was a seat at the front of the table and, you know, that's where I was told to sit. Um, at that point, um, it was Maddie doing all the talking. Matthew Madonna. Yes. And on the table was a, um, a pistol. Uh, a knife, uh, an ashtray, a picture of a saint, and a, a lighter, and the, um, one of those um, needles that you use like for a uh, diabetic, that yeah. kind of needle was on the table. And, um, and he basically, you know, said, do you know why you're here? Now, this question, you, you could never say yes. <laughs> uh, um, I've had heard stories of guys that did. I mean, technically, I guess they're supposed to kill you at that point, but um, they start out asking you, do you know why you're here? And obviously you're going to say no. <laughs> and um, 
I was a little shocked because they just come right out and tell you, well, you're here to, um, we're, we're uh, considering making you a member. Uh, we are the Lucchese crime family. And, you know, and then it goes like that. And basically um, asking you if you would, if called upon, would kill for the family. And, you know, you would, obviously you're going to say yes. And um, there is even a part of, uh, where um, your it's mentioned that if your kid was in the hospital uh, dying and you were at the bedside and you were called by any member of this family, you, you would have to leave that bedside and come to to us. And you know, and of course you're going to say yes. And I can guarantee you that every guy that said yes is never going to leave their kid at their bedside. Um, um, you know, and. It's this whole ceremony. I, I described it in further detail and, and, and testimony. Oh, we're going to make this a multiple part series. We'll probably continue yeah. the ceremony. So, so basically, basically, it's just, you know, it's basic questions that everybody's asked. And then at that point, you're, you're asked to, um, you know, which finger would be your shooting finger, if you're righty or lefty. And it's the person that's proposing you that's sitting to the left of you and and or could be the right of you whatever and it's that's the person who's going to prick your finger which was john yes and john being the big kid that he is almost stuck the thing through my finger because he <laughs> john likes to play games and um and you know those drops of blood would be dripped upon a saint and you know they'll tell you what they're going to do that we're going to light this saint and we want you to move it from hand to hand and repeat after us um or after me it was maddie was going to talk and you know all of that took place and and you know and then at that point obviously you would drop the saint and it it it, it, it burns in the ashtray and you're done at that point and but then they do something that they they would lock arms and you're kind of locking into each other as one you know what i mean because now you are you now have become usual individuals at this table represent an organization but you also represent each other so you're locking in at, as as one you knows now we are one and that's a symbolic thing and it's in, in a very old school thing and, Matt, and maddie was very eloquent in the way he spoke and spoke in italian at times well, i was gonna say i um i read both things i read to keep some traditions where parts of it are in italian and parts of it are in english correct I mean, yes. that's the case right yes and um and then at that point you're now immediately introduced to everybody at, in that room because that's how you're, you know, obviously you're recognized to be introduced and, and that's the first process is to introduce you to uh, everyone there. That's and not, even- not, How many guys were in the room? Um, roughly. Roughly, you know, I, let me just, Roughly, I'll tell you. I, I would say six to eight guys. Got it. Now, now yeah. did you the six to eight guys that were there, aside from the three, it was a, it's minus you, your boy, and, and the new inductee. Did you know these other guys? Or you or were you, oh, shit, I didn't know he was a friend, and you were surprised. Um, like, did you know those guys when you walked up? Yes. Oh, so yes, I knew. Okay. Yes, I knew who everybody was. It wasn't uh, that there was somebody there that I didn't know. I knew who everybody was. I just obviously could have never been introduced to them. And just for the record, um, you know, um, uh, you know, when you are when you are being introduced to a person that holds a rank of captain. That is not the way the introduction happens. The introduction happens where he's called a, 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 a capo regime. Yeah. And that is 100% factual. It happens to this day. That is a word that is 100% used. That is how an introduction is made when they don't say captain. That's not, that's not how it goes. No one will ever say 
no, let me never say never because there have been some introductions that they say this is he's a skipper with them but th that's the formal way of the introduction when it comes to a captain um and so there was uh several captains there and you know that's the way i was introduced to them and I, the only person that was not there stevie was not there okay. um for whatever reason but uh maddie and uh uh, Joe Tanapoli were there. Joe Tanapoli was consigliere at that at that time, and uh, he was there. So you know, usually you should have at least one, or you know, in, in my case, I had two. You should have someone representing the administration there. Got it. Now, now, because um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna wrap this up. So we're gonna do some pieces and and be interested in how many parts you get. But but what was the experience? Was it like as you know, you're in your forties. And Correct. I'm in your forties. Was it like having a child? Was it a religious experience? Did it feel like getting married? Give us the emotions um, that you had during the ceremony. It was, it, it's, it was strange because, um, you know, growing up in in the areas that I did, you always would wonder what this ceremony would be like you, you obviously you only had to wonder because you couldn't know you could even read about it yeah. or if they showed a movie about it but there was nothing in comparison to what took place and and he um, he meaning maddie had really done um a very very good job you know if, if i could say it like that at, at, at this ceremony and his speaking and the way he did it. And it was serious. This was not no game. You know what I mean? Right. You knew that this was not a game. And when I had waited then for Anthony, for them to do him, and that's a term that we use in the street. When they say they're going to do him, that's what that means. That means that they're straightening him out. And so it wasn't until like, I don't think it hit me. <laughs> You, like I thought it would when we walked out of there. It just was like a regular day after that. And we went and had a drink in Brooklyn. And then it wasn't until like, you know, you start realizing the respect that you were getting oh, wow. that now you could take this in two different ways. You could, you could, a, a guy could let this go to his head and you know, it's going to be terrible for him because it's not going to go well, or you could kind of try to stay low key because I learned what history has taught us is that's that, you know, you got to be very careful. Right. Yeah. And they're even, I could tell you something quickly yeah. and why they're so good. And I mean the Sicilians in the Gambinos. I had to go not long after that and meet with Lorenzo over an issue. Wait, and I understand some people are calling him the number one guy in the Gambino family right now, no? I, well, I mean, that's, that's what they're saying. At, at that time, he was not in that position. He was uh, a capo regime, yeah. right? Um, he may have been acting in an acting position at that time. I'm not, I think it might've happened right after this meeting with me, but yeah. I had a meeting with him right after this, right? Oh, wow. And he did something and he did something and I realized that later that he tested me because here I am to him. I was younger and I I'm brand new. Right. Yeah. So while I went to go talk to him, he comes over and says, Oh, sorry. I just had to go talk to this guy. He says, Hey, by the way, do you want me to introduce you to him? He's a friend with the Columbos. And I looked at him and I said, I mean, I have no reason to meet him. Lorenzo. I said, unless you, you want me to meet him, I'll meet him, but I don't have any reason to meet him. And he smiled and he looked at Pete and Zerillo and he, they liked, and he smiled at him and he walked away. And I knew he wanted to see what I was going to say, because you know what most guys would have said? They yeah. want to meet everybody. They want everybody to know who they are. And I didn't, I didn't, yeah. I didn't need, you know, so that's, that's basically where I was at. I didn't, I didn't let that go to my head at all. You know, and I tried to stay humble and, wow. you know, yeah, I try. This is, I mean, so listen, so if you're listening in or watching in, you know, this far, this is something of interest. Um, so we're, we're going to keep this going. So for now, this will be part one. Um, John, I'll, I'll put a link below for sit down news. Um, John and I are going to hook back up probably 
very soon um, for the part three, so stay tuned for that. But I'm going to get this up right away. And John, listen, uh, just thanks for a really strong out of the gate part one. And uh, I really appreciate it, brother. You're welcome. It was good uh, talking with you.